Um, this morning, uh, we are actually in the final message of a mini-series that we've entitled Undefiled. Uh, for those of you that have been with us over the last couple of weeks, um, in week one of this series, we have been talking about human trafficking, about the whole understanding of how men, women, and children are being enslaved uh, and taken away and transported to different parts of the world and, and basically forced into labor or, or sexual slavery. Um, and we, we've understood that that's not relegated to a certain part of the world, but that it actually encompasses the entire world. Um, in week two of the series, we talked about pornography and how, how the pornography has become a, a billion-dollar industry, how it's basically kind of taken over society in so many different ways and so many different medias. Um, and we've talked about how sex trafficking and pornography are connected. And last week we talked about how God desires for us to be free of this, uh, both in, its, in being enslaved to pornography and just essentially the behaviors that it uh, causes us to, to kind of engage in. Um, this week we're going to learn about sanctification and about God's instruction on sex and how we can live lives of freedom and purity. Uh, so this morning, I just want you guys to go ahead and open up to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm going to read from verses 3 to 8. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God. And that in this matter, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins, as we told you and warned you before. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. Paul is the one that is writing these words, and so... Let me just give a little bit of context into what, or the reason why Paul is writing this, and to, to who he's writing it to. He's writing it to a group of believers in a place called Thessalonica. Um, it's an ancient city, um, much like Corinth. Uh, it's, a, it's a major city in that it's a port city, so there's a lot of uh, goods and things that are being shipped into the city through this, into this part of the world through this city. But it's also a city that's really known for its sexual immorality. It's really known for, uh, much like Corinth, uh, Corinth has got Epaphrodite and how there's worship of the, the sex goddess. In this place, there's a, a group of deities called Kabiri, uh, and what they promote is gross sexual immorality just out there at any time in the streets. And so, in this specific place, in this specific city, the worship of, of sex goddesses wasn't rele relegated to a street corner or to a particular area in the city, but it was something that was just open and, and, and basically everywhere you go, there was some image, there was some worship going on of, of these sex deities or, or the Kabiri. And so it's to this group of believers that Paul is writing this letter. And we have to understand that it doesn't just infiltrate a certain part of life, but it, it, this whole practice infiltrated every part of life. And so that those who engaged in such practices were actually honored and revered. For you to be someone who participated in worshiping in this manner, you were lifted up as someone who was high in society. And it's to this, to this culture, it's to this group of people that Paul is addressing this, this letter. And before I go any further, I want to help us understand that this actually looks a lot like our culture nowadays. In 2014, our society and culture are not too different from Thessalonica. In the media, I mean, last week, Pastor Sam shared how the whole idea of pornography has become a billion-dollar industry. If you turn on the radio, if you listen, if you watch TV, you'll see how the media has glorified sex how the media or how songs and how various artists are, are actually being glorified if they engage in some sexual act, whether it be on TV or whether it be in the, on the radio. It's glorified, and it's really no different than it was back then. And so as Paul is writing these words, I don't want you to think of it as something that's outdated or if something that's irrelevant to us because it's so long ago. But in reality, the way our society is shaping up, it's actually looking more and more like it did back then. 
So these words that Paul is writing is actually very relevant to us today. Look with me to verse 3. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality. So throughout this letter, Paul has alluded to this idea of sanctification, how he wants the believers of Thessalonica to be sanctified. And it's in this particular sentence that he drives the point home that it is not an option, but it is God's will that you be sanctified. And sanctified is just another word of saying being set apart or being holy or being just like Christ. As Paul pens these words, he knows very well that the very believers he's writing to are constantly being bombarded by sexual images, sexual worship, all sorts of pagan practices, and he's, he's wear, very aware of it. In fact, it is probably true that people within their, that church, many of them are also struggling in sexual sin because it has become such a norm for their society. But he calls them to look at the bigger picture. He wants them to understand, look, Jesus just didn't save you for the fact of, just for the sake of becoming saved, but he saved you for this ultimate purpose of looking just like him. That's the ultimate goal of your salvation, is that you would become just like Jesus. And so I imagine people are hearing this for the first time, are like, that's utterly impossible. If you know the struggles that I'm going through as a man or as a woman, if you've known the things that I've done, even after I've come into the faith, you would, you would never say that it would be possible for me to become like Jesus. But yet Paul writes these words, it is God's will that you be sanctified. It is in his plan. He knew full well all that you'd be struggling with, but it is his will that you will look just like Jesus, be holy just as Jesus. And one of the keys to sanctification or becoming like Jesus is this, is that you have to understand that it's a process. The moment you became a Christian, the moment you decided to follow Jesus, you didn't instantly change into Jesus Christ the next moment. You still had the same struggles. You still engaged in similar sins. But it, the whole process of becoming like Jesus is that as you mature in Christ, as you follow him, God is slowly freeing you from sins, from habitual sins that you've, been, that, that you've been kind of enslaved to over the past years of your life. It's a process. But then this brings up a very important question. Do you trust in the process? Do you trust in the process of sanctification? Do you believe that God can truly deliver you and make you into someone who is sanctified, someone who is just like Jesus? Because this is where I believe so many of us get off course, is that we believe and trust in Jesus to rescue us from our sins, that we believe that God can provide us salvation, but we don't believe that he can carry us the rest of the way and make us like him. You know, and Jesus ultimately becomes someone, something like a lifeguard, right? Whenever we need him, whenever we're in deep trouble or in deep waters, whenever a situation gets that bad is when we'll call on him to bail us out of the water. And ultimately, Jesus just becomes that to us. He's just going to rescue us whenever we're in deep trouble. But I want you to know, Jesus is so much more than that. Jesus wants to rescue you from you so that you can be just like him. That's the ultimate goal of salvation. is isn't just to rescue you from sin, but he's ultimately trying to rescue us from ourselves so that we could be just like him. And as a college student, which was a very, very, very long time ago, sad, um, um, back then I was wrestling with a lot of questions. And, and if you're in college, many of you are, I know you're probably wrestling with these same questions too. It's at that point in life, between like the ages of 18 to 24, 25, you're, there's, there's these questions that kind of come at you. What's my major going to be? What's my career going to be? Who, is, who am I going to marry? Who is my spouse going to be? And, and all these questions kind of start forming in your brain, and you're like kind of stressing it. And, I, and God only knows how many hours, maybe how many days I've wasted thinking about these things in college, when I probably should have been studying for my next exam, I've just been kind of playing the role of philosopher and trying to figure out what is going on with my life. And it creates a lot of stress and it creates a lot of tension. 
Where am I going? What's going to happen? And, you know, I guess maybe trying to play a spiritual spin on things, I begin to ask this question, well, what is God's will for me? What does God will for me in terms of a major, in terms of a career, in terms of a spouse? But in reality, I didn't care about God's will. I cared about what made me happy. I wanted the right major. I wanted to know that the, the career path I chose would provide me a lot of wealth and make me secure. I wanted to, to be with a spouse that was going to make me happy. I just wanted to stay happy. I didn't care about God's will, really. It was really about what would make me feel happy and secure. And this is really especially relevant when we talk about sexual sin or sexual immorality. We engage in it because it makes us feel happy. It's all about happiness. The world will tell you it's okay to view pornography because it's okay to look at women with lust. It's, it's okay to engage in adultery because it makes you feel good. You're not hurting anyone. It's just between you and, and really no one else. Um, it's your own personal way of coping with stress or emotions. Do it because it helps you feel sane or better. It's, it's just a way for you to enjoy life. There really aren't any consequences. No one's going to be hurt by what you're doing. You know, I mentioned just a moment ago about the process of sanctification, how you're becoming more and more like Jesus. I want to throw in another curve. There's also a process of depravity, right? The more we engage in sexual sin, especially sexual immorality, the more and more and more depraved we become. And you might tell me, man, I'm a Christian. I would never let it get that far. I mean, I know how to keep myself within control. Well, for my own personal life, I can tell you that I have had family members who are strong, solid Christians who, to this day, are living in the consequences of sexual sin. I can tell you that they didn't become like that right off the bat. You know, there's, there's stories of, of people I've grew up with who have told me that they've been sexually abused by men in the church, men who have been elders, men who have been leaders in the church. Do you think that they became that way overnight? No. I would say that they became that way over a course of time when they engaged in sexual sin for so much and for so long that their mind became more and more and more depraved. So be careful when you say that I'm, I'm not going to get that far, it's not really that bad, because the more you engage in it, the more you are becoming more and more depraved. And pretty much watching pornography for a moment isn't going to be enough for you one day. One day it's going to be something more risky, something, something else that you wanted to engage in. So be really careful when you understand that, you know, this isn't a big deal. When you call sexual sin or sexual morality as something, something small, understand that it's, it's a much bigger deal than that. So this morning, I want to ask you, what process do you find yourself in this morning? Do you feel like you're in the process of sanctification or do you, are you in the process of depravity? Where are you at? Where are you at in the, in the, in the process? Like I said this morning, Paul's plea is for the believers of Jesus Christ to understand God's will is their satisfaction. Do you trust that God's ultimate will is better than your own happiness? Or are you more bent on trying to find ways to become happy? Whether it be your career pursuits or whether it be just engaging in sexual sin, are you bent on trying to be happy? Or are you willing to say, I trust that God's got it, I understand that God's got it, and I'm willing to trust in this process of sanctification? And let me make sure to make this clear. God isn't trying to, you know, it's not that God doesn't want us to be happy, all right? It isn't that God doesn't want us to be joyful. But I think what he wants us to understand, that our greatest joy is becoming just like his son. Our greatest joy is becoming just like Christ. And what the world, isn't, what, what the world doesn't need is a happier version of Jason. But what the world could use are a lot of people who are just like Jesus. Does that make sense? What the world doesn't need are happier versions of you or me. But the world really needs is Jesus. And so the more we can press ourselves into this process of becoming sanctified, becoming like Christ, the more we can serve God's purpose in the world. Look with me to verse 3 and 4. It's God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way 
that is holy and honorable. So over the past few weeks, we've talked so much about sexual sin and sexual, sexual immorality that you might come across, we might come across as saying, oh, well, sex is bad. You know, Pastor Sam, Jason, everyone's just telling us just to kind of go off on a distant place, isolate ourselves and kind of look after sheep and cows and just live a single life. I mean, I'm not here to tell you sex is bad, okay? Sex is not bad. But it's got to be done, it's got to be in the right context. And if you examine God's word from the beginning, Genesis chapter 1, in verse 27, you don't have to turn there, but God created man and woman in his own image. And his very first instruction to them is, be fruitful and multiply, subdue the land. So, not only is sex not bad, but understand that God created sex. It was God's invention. It was God's gift to mankind. All right? It was God's invention. But in verse 4 of chapter 1, I'm sorry, in chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians, Paul states for believers to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable. So with respect to sex, what does this look like? If you examine God's word from the beginning to the end, God's instruction indicates sex is between a man and a woman only within the context of marriage. That's it. There's no gray area. There's no fuzziness about that. It's plain and simple. It's between a man and a woman only within the context of marriage. This is what God had designed it for. This is, how, this is what God had commanded and the way he intended for sex to be used. God intended sex to be the most intimate way of expressing love in the most intimate of all relationships in the earth between a man, between a husband and a wife. What has happened is, is our society has kind of twisted this gift, has abused this gift, and has changed it in so many different ways. And, and we're seeing the reper repercussions of that over the course of time. This morning, I, I want to talk to you guys who are single, especially who are uh, eagerly anticipating getting married. Um, I want you to understand that, you know, enjoy your singleness, enjoy it for all that you can enjoy it for, and understand that God has got you where he's got you for a reason. And God, who has brought you into existence, is the one that's going to see you through to the end of your existence on this earth. God is the one that's going to, at the appropriate time, provide for you that person that he wants you to be married to, if he calls you to be married. And, and you have to understand, that gift that God has given you in, in sex is, that, is not to be opened until that appropriate time when you're with that person, whoever he or she is. So until then, focus on becoming sanctified. Focus on that being the will that you pursue. Become sanctified. For those of us who are married, operating in this context in terms of using sex in the way God has called us to is also a struggle. You know, I recently celebrated my eight-year wedding anniversary. Um, my coworkers were joking around with me about this thing called a seven-year itch, and I didn't quite understand what that meant, but then they were telling me a little bit more about, well, after seven years, it's usually when you begin to feel curious about maybe exploring relationships with other people. And I was like, oh, I never had that itch. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, at, at any point, it's so true, though. How many lives, how many marriages have really been ruined because people have engaged in another affair with someone else? You know, I want to encourage you, my brothers and sisters, to, to, to hang strong, to, to stay, to, to allow your love to grow over the years. You know, I was re remembering uh, this, this thing about my, my childhood. When I was about 15 years old, my parents moved us into a new home in Rowlett. And when we moved into the house, it was completely brand new. There was these two trees that were out in the front. And they were really just, just brand new trees. They were very thin, very scrawny. Um, barely any taller than me, um, and that was back in 95. And now about 20 years later, I, I was just looking back, and these trees have grown to be ginormous. I mean, they're massive trunks, they're taller than the house, full of leaves, full of just branches. It's, it's just a thick tree, it's huge, it's, it's, it's a massive tree. And, you know, I think about it, so much has happened since 95 for me. I mean, so much has happened in my family's life since 1995. I mean. But 
these trees seemed unfazed. I mean, they were unfazed by whatever happened in the world. They just kept growing. They just kept getting stronger. They just kept getting bigger. And for those of us who are married, I, I kind of want that for us, for, our, uh, for our, us and our love to grow like these trees did so that no matter what happens in our lives, whether it be that we uh, are, are faced with tragedy or we're faced with joy and blessings, at, at all points, our love for our spouses would grow, would get stronger. And even in the midst of distractions or temptations, when that comes our way, that instead our love would continue to grow and continue to get stronger and flourish, that perhaps 30 to 40 to 50 years from now, we could be, our love for one another could be as strong as these, these trees, as strong as oaks, proclaiming God's faithfulness, proclaiming that it was right for us to do it God's way. It was right for us to follow God's instruction. That's what I'd pray for for us and for all of us here who are either married or ultimately waiting to get married. Let's look to verse 5. And really, it's 5 to verse 8, but I'm not going to read the entire thing for the sake of time. But I want to kind of highlight Paul's words as it relates to wickedness, as it relates to pagans. Paul is essentially calling out the society that the church is in right now when he's addressing paganism, when he's he's addressing sexual immorality. Uh, I think it's very important for us as a church to recognize that sexual immorality exists. And, And over the last two weeks, that's what we've done, is that we've called out the fact that sexual human trafficking is taking place, pornography is taking place. It isn't that we're trying to ignore it or cover it up as if it doesn't exist, but we understand that it does and that it affects even the lives of believers. We've learned about the porn industry, and like I said before, it's a billion-dollar industry. We've learned about human trafficking throughout the entire world. You know, it's a consistent problem that we all are are hearing about and and facing. And, And did you even know that actually today, like we said, it's Super Bowl Sunday, um, I don't know if you knew this, but this is actually the largest annual human trafficking event in the United States. Tens of thousands of women and girls are actually, tra- being, or probably already there, have been transported to New Jersey for the purpose of sex, for being exploited for sex or forced labor. I don't know if you knew that, but it is true that the Super Bowl Sunday is actually the day where it's, it's the largest uh, annual human trafficking event in the U.S., um, I remember uh, a few years ago, the Super Bowl was held here in Dallas, and a story of a man who drove up from Austin with two teenagers who were sisters, and his intention was to exploit them for sex. Thankfully, he was caught before anything happened, and he was recently convicted and sentenced to prison. You know, I want to, essentially what I'm trying to say all this is because I want to bring this to our attention, because it's easy for us to kind of live in our bubble. You know, we'll be watching the Super Bowl tonight, scarfing down a pizza and wings or whatever, But I want us to be aware of the greater reality, the more painful reality of what's going on outside of our bubble. And so it's so important, and and I appreciate Paul's willingness to call out sin even when it's taking place in society. He's not willing to overlook it, cover it up, dismiss it. He's willing to call it out and address the fact, we know this is going on. What are we going to do about it? How do we respond to living in a sexualized culture? Look with me to verse 7. Paul tells us simply to pursue holiness. Don't give in to the ways of our society. Don't simply settle in and say it's okay. Don't tolerate it. Paul implores the church to take a stand. Pursue what's right. Pursue holiness. Over the past two weeks, we've heard this acronym for PURE. P-U-R-E, PURE. P, standing for prayer praying for repentance, praying, for, praying corporately, individually, praying to rely on the Holy Spirit, praying for wisdom. You, which stands for understand, understanding God's divine purposes, understanding that we have an enemy that we have to be aware of. R, which stands for resolve, making a resolution to flee from sin. And E, which stands for engage, loving others. You know, I'm not going to go into depth because we've already been talking through these acronyms before, over the last couple of weeks, but I do want to bring this point across to you. Is that as you're looking to live a life of prayer and understanding, resolve and engaging others, I want you to know that those of, for, for all of us who are struggling in sexual sin, to 
to not go at it alone. Now, I think that's the biggest mistake is for us to think that we're struggling with this and we're, we're alone and we, we just need to kind of be to ourselves because no one else is going through it. It's important for us to understand that we have to have someone with us to kind of help us, to encourage us, to, to be hard on us lovingly, to help us understand that this is the mark, this is the will of God for us to be sanctified. And you really need someone to help you through, throughout that time. I know for me, I had an accountability partner for several years, uh, right, right before I got married, and that person helped me in terms of providing me encouragement, provi- praying for me, being hard on me when I needed it. And he essentially was, was God's blessing to me that, that that whole relationship took place. So I want you guys to understand that that's got to be a focus. If you're looking to come out of this sin, you can't do it on your own. You have to be willing to be open and honest with someone about it. I want to just to give you a couple of ideas of who that person could be. It could be someone, is that definitely has to be someone of the same gender, um, someone who can, you would say, someone you could trust, obviously, not someone who's going to put your stuff out on Facebook, um, someone you can definitely trust and provide your spiritual wisdom and guidance. Um, if you need any help with that, you can always look to us for, for guidance and we can pair you with the right person. But essentially, it's so important to walk out of sin with someone else kind of by your side and helping you along. Um, Paul, again, says, pursue holiness, take his stand. I wanted to kind of end with this story here about what took place last Sunday at the Grammys. Um, you guys, anybody, anybody watch the Grammys last week? Nobody. Oh, you guys are like me. Good. Um, I never pay attention to the Grammys. I, just, I got more important things to do, but not to dismiss the Grammys. I'm sure it's a great thing. Um, but it came to my attention this week on Facebook um, because of a singer who walked out um, of the Grammys. And you might have heard of the story. Uh, a Christian singer named Natalie Grant uh, just up and walked out of the Grammys. And, and she kind of placed this uh, note on Facebook. And she says, We left the Grammys early. I have many thoughts about the show tonight, most of which are probably better left inside my head. But I'll say this. I've never been more honored to sing about Jesus and for Jesus. And I've never been more sure of the path I've chosen. See, she never really specified the reason why she left the Grammys. um, But based on what she's saying, it's something to do with what happened in the program itself, something about the show itself. And so I decided to do a little bit more research. uh, And I read through an article that kind of consisted of her remarks. And it says this about the kind of show, I guess the program that happened there. And, And... This is what it said. Uh, The sexually charged duet featuring Beyonce and her husband Jay-Z was characterized by some as raunchy. A witch-themed performance by Katy Perry was dubbed as being satanic in nature. And many expressed disgust at the mass, same-sex, and heterosexual wedding that was officiated by Queen Latifah on stage following a performance of the homosexual advocacy song One Love, uh, sung by Macklemore and Ryan Lewis. I don't know. I I know some of these people here. I don't know the, the last couple people. Um, it sounds like it was a very, um, gosh, I, I don't even know what, what the words to say, but it was definitely an immoral type of a program, it sounds like, based on what I'm, uh, what I'm reading. Um, I don't know what your opinions are of Nat- Natalie Grant, the singer who walked out of the Grammy Awards, but at the very least, it's shown me two things for me personally. One, how depraved our society has come, you know, that these were the types of things that took place on stage. Number two, I'm impressed that she took a stand. Now, um, that's impressive to me. She was willing to say, look, I'm not going to be part of this. I'm going to just up and get out of here. And she chose to to leave. And and even though she's been bashed on social media for what she's done, even though people have, you know, condemned her for her actions, you know, I I applaud the fact that she actually wasn't going to willingly just sit there and say, I'm going to tolerate this, or I'm going to close my eyes through these sections, or or this and that, but she ultimately said, look, I've had enough, and I'm going to pursue holiness. I'm going to stand for what I believe in, and that's for Jesus. And so ultimately, she leaves. The question would be, is how would you or I have responded? I guess a greater question would be, is how are we responding in our workplaces, um, in conversations that we hear around us? How are we responding? Are we just turning a silent ear to it? Are we pretending that it's not there? Or are we pursuing holiness? As I close this morning, um, 
I want to remind you of Paul's words that God's will for our lives is to be sanctified. It's for us to be just like Jesus. In a few moments, we'll be partaking in communion. We'll be taking of the bread, taking of the cup. But I want you to remember, Jesus didn't die just to rescue you from sin, but he, he died to rescue you from yourself. He, he wants you to be just like him. As I said earlier, the world doesn't need a happier version of you. The world around you needs Jesus. The more we immerse ourselves in becoming like Jesus, the more we can help those around us who are struggling with sexual sin or struggling with anything. We have adults, teenagers, and even young children who are struggling in sin and need help. And they need Jesus, not a happier version of us. So I pray you and I would be willing to pursue holiness and help those around us do the same. As Paul says, it is God's will for you to be sanctified. Let me pray for us. Father, we just thank you and praise you that you speak into our situations even here in 2014 that you're not ignorant of our struggles, that you're not turning a cold eye towards us and the problems that we're going through and saying, look, I've got other problems to worry about. But instead, you know very well the struggle that we're in and you're very, very, very concerned for us. Thank you that through Paul, we understand that your ultimate will for our lives is to be sanctified, is to be like Jesus, that you are unwilling to, to leave us in this state of sin, but you want us to to become more and more like your son. Thank you that through the Holy Spirit that is possible. Thank you that through the church and through the support of accountability partners that is possible. And my prayer for us this morning as a church is that we would willingly engage in this process of sanctification, that we wouldn't engage in the process of depravity, but that we would willingly engage in becoming like Jesus, that we would do whatever it takes to flee from sin, to engage in uh, our accountability partners to do what we can to avoid sin so we can be sanctified. And ultimately, Father, I pray that that would be the driving force of our joy, that we would find greatest joy in becoming like Jesus and understanding that that is what we need and that is what the world around us needs. Give us the courage and the strength to stand up for you and for your holiness, even in a sexualized culture that we're living in today. Help us to be a part of the solution and not a part of the problem. Thank you for hearing our prayer. We ask this in Jesus' name.